Welcome back to the Abundant Harvest Homestead. I'm Papa Pepper, and today I got a little bit of a different one. It was actually inspired by something that another homesteader said. And when he was saying what he said, the part that stuck out most to me was what he said about pretty much is gonna cause a lot of people to die if things actually get bad. And it's amazing to think about because first of all, I think he was pretty dead on. I don't mean that pun, um, but I think he was dead on on it. And I think that it's one of the things too that he points out, if you really like live in the city, it, it's a great skill to have. And if you aspire to kind of live a more agrarian country life, it's a skill you can practice in the city to help prepare you for when you, when you make your exodus and you make it out to the country. Also, it's something that if you live in the city and things always continue as they have been recently, meaning no great apocalyptic shutdown and stuff hitting the fan scenario happens, it's gonna be a lot better for you financially but if things do get terrible, um, it may be that one thing that separates those who are gonna survive it from those who aren't gonna make it. And personally, in all things in life, if I can avoid a, a foolish, avoidable death, I'm down. Why, why die a foolish death if it's avoidable? Why not put forth some effort ahead of time so that I, uh, I don't just sit there and perish unnecessarily? I know I'm not gonna make it out of here alive. I know that uh, one day death will come for me, but I also know that I'm a, I'm a father and a husband right now, and I'm the earthly provider for this family. Since I am, I take it very seriously, and especially with children who, you know, children often aren't really good at protecting themselves. Children aren't really always very good at educating themselves, training themselves. Children aren't always very good at you know, just doing the things that an adult does for them, that a parent does for them. If they were, they wouldn't really need parents. But it's best for a child to be with both parents, both biological parents. Those are some of the healthiest kids, um, mentally, emotionally, stuff like that. It's sad that so much is corrupted and eroded away. And even I was contemplating back to uh, somebody who once made a comment when we announced that we were gonna have our fifth child. They're like, wow, five children already and stuff? And we're like, dude, you have five children. You know, that was our reply to that person. The, the deal was, though, they had two children with one ex-wife, three children with another ex-wife. And they didn't really see their children much. Came a time they didn't live in the same state as any of their children or ex-wives. Um, it's a lot different <laughs> when you see your children you know, daily basis. When you go somewhere and you've got the whole family together, it's, it's amazing. Um, but getting off subject. But a lot of times, back to the subject, it's the simple changes you make now in the present that prepare you for your future. And, you know, I've been known to say, I wanna live in such a way in the present so that when I get to the future, I don't regret my past. This one thing here, if you're older, um, you know, especially old enough to be like one of my parents, this is probably something you almost grew up doing and you've done your whole life. And it's just part of life for you. And if you're somebody who does live on a homestead right now or is, is leaning that way, there's a good chance you do this already. But if you're just kind of younger right now, or just kind of starting out on this whole, wow, I don't think the whole city life is really for me, um, and just kind of waking up to that, this might be something you've almost never done in your life, something you're not even very comfortable with, and something that as you think about it, you're like, okay, I'm a little intimidated, but it looks like I may have to, you know? Sometimes when it's do or die, it's literally do or die. And that's a dangerous situation to be in if you're not prepared to do. 
gotta empty some more buckets here, so throwing up another one of these. Uh, the children have done really well with taking all these guys off the ground in some areas because if they're running around playing in our yard and they fall on something like this, that ain't gonna be too good. If I put them in some rock pillar fences along my border, I've got a whole video. You can kind of see what I'm doing, but there's a video on it. Um, then they won't trip and fall on them. And one other thing before I dive into a deeper explanation of stuff is uh, I will say that having this one skill that I'm about to share with you that this guy points out is what's going to make a difference. He says if you don't know how to do this skill, he says you're going to be pretty low on the survival chart, meaning you're going to be one of the first to go. Um, this skill is actually one of the ones that I, I had. Um, sometimes you can even, if you're not raised that way, you can pick it up as a profession, even though it may not necessarily be your interest. Um, a lot of people at least have a frame of reference for it that way, but it's one of the skills that helped me kind of uh, woo Mama Pepper, if you will. <laughs> Kind of impress her and make her think, oh yeah, this guy here, this guy might work out. Let's add a couple to this, we're down to the bottom. So with these two, you'll notice with the bigger ones, I'll use those in the center more and uh, carefully place them on the outside. The smaller ones, if you just dump those in, they'll fill a void better, but remember, bigger odd shaped ones are gonna have greater holes between them and spaces. And if I want that to look like a pillar and there's a giant like section missing out of it on the side because of how big ones are in there, um, that'll just make it look weird. Not that I need to be too particular, but like for instance right here, see how that whole section is a void? I'll stuff some smaller ones in there. And sometimes the little ones that fall through are easy enough to fit through. They're small enough to fit through because they fell through. So I'll just kind of, you know, begin filling some of those in there and get to the point there's not that void. And for me, with the space I use for these, it takes about 11 or 12 buckets. There's 11 empty ones? Yeah, and I've got 12 for next time, for the next one. Now, I'll get the big heavy buckets down here, and I'll grab actually a handful of these little ones here. Um, <clears throat> but having the empty buckets make it back up here, um, there's only so many you can carry at a time, but thankfully they're nice and lightweight, so the little peppers can do that easy enough. One thing I'm gonna do in this video too, is I'll play a portion of the original video from the guy, from his family, and uh, then you can hear some things straight from his mouth. And also, um, give me a chance to introduce you guys to, to him. Um, we're, we're in the Ozarks, you know, he's down in Texas. There's different things that come into homesteading in those areas. A lot of overlap, but there's some different things too. Plus, we got our property and we're on well water and live in, you know, a trailer home, a mobile home. Uh, they're doing a shed to house conversion is what they did for their family. And I think they're on water catchment. So if there's things that fall more into those categories you're more interested in, might be a good chance for me to introduce you to their channel and their family as well. So the video was one from Better Together Homestead. Um, and I've known of Bo for a number of years. And he was talking about five things that homesteaders do. And he had a good list of some stuff which people should really consider. And in the midst of that, one of them was cooking. I'll first let you hear what he says on that subject if you want to look at the whole video of all five things. It's only like a seven minute video. I'll link it up here. But I'll play what he says about cooking first and then I'll come back and add some of my thoughts on this. Number three, homesteaders cook. So if you are not actually cooking your own meals, no, you're definitely not a homesteader. 
I would say that most people that aspire to be a homesteader, that you do cook. If you don't cook, then I think you're really low on the survival threshold. You know, I, I, I don't understand. If you live in a big city where you don't cook very often, or if you're young and this is something that you dream of, then this is your number one skill that you need to be able to start doing, is learning how to cook. Um, I know I've talked about it before, by far the easiest thing to know is you know multiple ways that you can use ground beef and also knowing how to cook whole chicken. Whenever we lived in suburbia, I mean, it was probably every nine out of 10 friends that we had when we were first married, none of them knew how to cook a whole chicken. Cooking whole chicken did for us is it allowed us to stretch our grocery budget because you buy a whole chicken, then you get so many different meals in that one purchase versus if you just buy thighs or boneless, skinless chicken breasts, it's like some of the worst uh, purchases that you can make. It's also just not, it's not good for you because it's, you're not getting all of the goodness that is in that bird. And there was a couple things particularly that he said there that made me think and consider. Um, one is when he says if you don't cook. If you don't cook, then I think you're really low on the survival threshold. You know, you're really low on the survival threshold. And you know, the knee-jerk reaction to that, of course, is okay, let's 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 consider. This person doesn't even know how to turn things into food. How to make uh, things that can be edible, edible. Because generally considering, we're gonna say, if you just try to eat raw chicken, you're not gonna be around for very long. It's not gonna work out very well for you. So, if you're outsourcing even something as simple as making things edible, boy, that's dangerous, and I think that a homesteader mentality um, is to be more self-sufficient. A lot of us would emphasize, you know, self-sufficient under God's provision. Um, but it's it's cutting out all those middlemen. Those middlemen not only cause a markup in everything, um, but it does become harder to trust too because you don't know how many people were in between there and what they were up to. And moreover, it, it adds a lot of. It not only increases the cost, but it increases the potential for disruption. There's not a lot that's going to disrupt me walking up to my garden to get uh, a piece of food uh, that I can eat raw. It's not going not gonna to be a lot that can disrupt that. Terrible storm, might not want to risk it. If uh, something happens to my legs where I can't walk for the time being, okay, maybe that. Other than that, there's not a lot. But if my food is grown in, in California, um, where they're pumping water out to it just to have water to make it grow, okay, that's one thing that can be disrupted. And then it's got to get picked by somebody and then shipped somewhere else and then uh, packaged somewhere and then distributed again to a, to a main distribution center for a certain overarching corporation. And then it gets split up from there where it gets unloaded and then people uh, take it off the shelves and they put it on the thing. And then the uh, you know it's available there on the shelf of the store, and I can hop in my vehicle and go drive over there. You know, like there's so many more steps in the process that can be disrupted. But what I'm looking at is a lot of homesteaders just try to avoid the outsourcing of things. If I can do it myself, I'll do it myself. I'm actually right now, I'm taking some of my 3B oak lumber that I buy directly from the sawmill to save a lot of money, and I'm just building a small shelf on the back of this platform here so I can store more things and without crushing them see them at a glance here under my shipping container lean-to. Um, I could pay somebody to do this. I could um, go to the store and, and buy one that's already made. Or I can do it myself. So that's part of it, is not outsourcing everything. But it goes beyond that. As he as he points out, it comes into vulnerability. Um, you're going to be really low on the survival rate uh, or opportunity if things get bad because you don't know how to make things edible. 
that is ridiculous. It really is. And, and I think that as people kind of go to a more homesteading life, um, you know, if you're on a raw food diet and all you eat is raw foods and fruits and vegetables and stuff, yeah, then you don't know, you don't need to know how to cook, okay? Um, but for a lot of us, the things that come in from the garden, we eat some raw, we put some up for the future, and, and we cook to eat it. Um, you're not, I mean, I guess you could probably make like a raw pasta sauce. Um, take some different herbs and some tomatoes and just kind of blend them up. But a lot of times we're going to cook it down. We're going to, you know, infuse the flavors more and stuff by cooking it. And even like with animal husbandry, raising up our own stuff. I don't, I don't walk out to the chicken coop and get a rotisserie chicken. I don't. And the part he said about a whole chicken, I'm going to replay a clip of that, but, but listen to this. And also knowing how to cook whole chicken. Whenever we lived in suburbia, I mean, it was probably every nine out of 10 friends that we had when we were first married, none of them knew how to cook a whole chicken. Cooking whole chicken did for us is it allowed us to stretch our grocery budget because you buy a whole chicken, then you get so many different meals in that one purchase versus if you just buy thighs or boneless, skinless chicken breasts, it's like some of the worst uh, purchases that you can make. It's also just not, it's not good for you because it's, you're not getting all of the goodness that is in that bird. Yeah, part of what he points out there is you're not getting everything that you could from a boneless, skinless breast. And, and we know that there's stuff in the skin that can be nutritious. We know there's stuff in the bones. And once it's only boneless, skinless breast, especially if you're like only getting like Chick-fil-A or the gas station chicken tenders or something else where it's always just, you know, boneless, MSG, breaded, deep fried, or as they say, crispy, because we don't like fried, right? Uh, so they just relabel it, same thing. Um, if that's all you're getting for chicken, you're missing out of a lot of what the animal brings to the table. And here, we try to use as much of anything that we possibly can. I mean, even even these garb behind me, okay, that's more decor that I'm, I'm gonna try to do some poor man's taxidermy. But right above me here, there's one, let me get it. Yeah, there's another one. Part of getting the most out of everything doesn't even always fall into uh, nutritional. I'll get back to that in a minute. But sometimes it's utility. Um, look at this. Gar scales. I can take gar scales, tip bamboo arrows with it, and use it to harvest more fish. I shot multiple fish this year using a gar scale as the arrowhead with a bamboo bow I made myself. Like, that is crazy. But that's part of getting more out of the animal. Um, I also got different, you know, bones and stuff to make tools with and things like that. Let me see if I can do this. Oh, hold on. But when we go back to nutritionally, I want you to think about that. Nutritionally. You're not getting all that the animal provides if you're not enjoying the whole thing. And, and cooking is a way to get more out of it. Um, when we have our animals that we eat, a lot of times a bone broth comes into play. I remember smoking some chickens and we ate the chicken meat. And then mama, to get the rest of the meat off the bones and more nutrition out of that animal, she made a, a broth with it and made a chicken soup. And chicken soup is really good. I really enjoy it but smoked chicken soup because that animal had been smoked. That was the flavor, one of the undertones. And when we enjoyed it, that was amazing. It really was. And, you know, nutritionally, so much more comes out of it when you cook and make something like bone broth rather than, you know, just throwing it away or only buying the breasts. And to us, we don't try to just use every animal as much as we possibly can out of respect for the animal. 
Um, part of it's out of respect for the creator of that animal, absolutely, but not the creature, the creator. Um, but it's just that there's so much more that we could be doing with what we have, rather than just throwing it away, as far too often is what people do. So it's not just always getting more out of it or being more financially solid um, that cooking brings to the table. But it is just that first layer of protection for you and your family. Um, there's so many simple recipes and very easy things. And then there's also, once you kind of start, there's an experimentation process. Um, in many ways, I would call Mama Pepper more of uh, a cook who is going to like um, follow the recipe to a T. This much of this, this much of that, bring it to a boil, let it boil for this long, then move forward. And that's great. And that comes in handy a lot. And there's other times where not every ingredient on the list is available, but some things are. Or I know that if I use this this way in this recipe, and this other thing this way in this recipe, it works like this. So what happens if I just combine them together? You know, I'm more experimental. I'm more winging it. I'm more, uh, We'll just grab some of this and chuck it in there rather than a tablespoon and a half. <laughs> and there's a variety of ways of, you know, doing things like that where it doesn't always need to be to a T. As long as you're actually cooking it and actually accomplishing making it edible, that's important. If you're not, you're going to be sick. And we were talking a bit ago um, with just even science people's diets. Like there's people who anytime they try to eat leftovers, they like get sick because uh, their their body's not accustomed to it where other people you know throw it in the fridge and they have it a couple days later and it's fine but there is a le level of you know not just even building up what your body's accustomed to of you don't want food poisoning you want to make sure things are cooked and not undercooked you don't want parasites you don't want bacteria you don't want to be ill you're trying to fuel your body and move it forward from there rather than just uh you know not just not just have something pleasant and tasty to eat, it's, it's fuel for your body. And if you can take that fuel away, like by not knowing how to cook and having fast food restaurants or other things be shut down, you're, you're not gonna be in a good state. Um, I think it's important to learn how to provide for yourself as much as possible, even if it's just a hobby for now or just something you have experience with and it's not the main thing you're doing. If you have a frame of reference for it, that way if you ever need to, you're not completely dumbfounded and struggling with, with things that could be very simple for you because you're accustomed to them. tell you what too um i'd recommend watching that whole video because the other four things he brings up that homesteaders do are, are worthwhile to consider and part of it is you know for me i consider the homesteading lifestyle to be the one that makes sense it's the one people used to live these days look out in the world what makes sense you ever watch politics does that make sense you ever watch uh the news does that make sense you ever watch what's happening at schools and colleges? Does that make sense? And if you think it all does, then go with the flow. By all means, go with the flow. But when the flow leads you to a waterfall, I won't be there. I won't be there at the bottom of the waterfall. 
I'll be somewhere else because that's why I'm upstream. <laughs> I went against the flow. I returned to something that made a little more sense and I think that that's part of it. Why do homesteaders do these things? It's not just that it's some arbitrary, weird, fun thing like, oh, I have nothing to do with my life so I'm just going to move out to the middle of nowhere and try to grow a garden and have an animal in my yard that the HOA won't allow me to have here. That's not, that's not the purpose. Or I'm just going to sell my quarter million dollar, you know, house so I can go build a shed or, you know, live in a shed and convert that to something and go debt free. It's not just that it's something fun to do. It's that it makes sense. It's that there's a purpose for it. A real connection to the real world that just simply isn't afforded in, in a cubicle. In living in a filing cabinet for people called an apartment building. You know, that, that's a different life. That's a different environment. It's a different way have to be a consumer rather than a producer and I think that the more dependent upon somebody else you are the more you're in their pocket the better you work out for them that's why banks like giving you loans because they make a ton of money off of you they make a ton of money off of you that's why banks like having your money in, in the bank account because they make a ton of money off of that it works out well for them that's why oh here I'll help you you need to cash your checks oh I'll help you oh here, you want to make 1% interest? <laughs> we'll help. Because <laughs> we can make like oh, 6 or 7% on that. So we'll keep that extra interest we're making. We'll just hang on to yours. And if you want it back, <laughs> we'll only give you a little bit at a time. Oh, you can only withdraw, you know, two or 400 from the ATM. Oh, you can only withdraw this much in a day from your actual account. We're still using it. We're still making good money off of it. We don't want you to have it all back. I digress, but don't outsource everything. I don't think it makes much sense either, I pointed out before, people leaving their home to go to school, to take a home ec class. Darling, is that what I think it is? Yeah, your food's right. Would you walk it over to me? I'm looking for my food. I got your sandals on. All right, hold on. Yeah, somebody shoved mine in the car, so I gave, I, I wore the pair I gave you. This seems like it's an appropriate end to this video. And it's part of it. We, uh, I shot some deer last year. We, we saved the meat. We, we learned how. We didn't know how. We learned how. We saved the meat in cans. Then my lady here takes those cans of meat. We knew how to go in that deer and get the food out of it. She takes those cans of meat and she makes me venison pot pie. <coughs> I'm doing a video about cooking kind of. <laughs> okay. Did you know how to cook when you grew up? And if so, how no, many things? Probably not. Probably not really. <laughs> so you're, you outsourced even making things edible, huh? Always depending upon somebody else? And what was one of the things that I knew about you when we first got together? That you liked to what? I like to eat. She liked to food. eat. She liked to eat good food. So what did I start doing? Cooking. I started thinking of anything I possibly could that would uh, that would make good food for her to eat, so she would like me. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, I had a, a number of restaurant jobs before where I had a lot of familiarity. And cool thing about restaurant jobs, you know how they cook a lot of times? Mm -hmm. How do they cook? Fast, big, large. Fast, big, and large portions. A lot of it's prep work. A lot of it's feeding an army. And then what happened when we got married? Um, we had children later? We, we raised our own army. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm used to cooking for large, large groups. And, uh, yeah. And we're going to try to find out how to live stream, right, my lady? Yes. See? What we're going to. We have somewhere written down. We haven't looked at it yet. What this baby is ahead of time. And because we... Because I lit my shipping container on fire and burned up a bunch of our precious baby stuff, um, we don't have that. And we don't want to have to replace boy and girl clothes if we're only having one of the two. And we're only having one of the two. We just don't know which one of the two yet. So if we peek ahead of time, then we can know what we need to replace. So I'm going to eat some of this food we cooked because we're homesteaders. One thing homesteaders do is cook. I'm going to enjoy that. And uh, if you guys go check out the Better Together Homestead video, uh, feel free to let them know Papa sent you. Papa sent you their direction. They just got over a bout with the uh, 
with the thing going around. I don't even know if I should say it because of, you know, AI algorithms and things. But uh, so they're, they're recovering from that. But still throwing out some videos here and there to bless others. We'll see you next time. Mom out. Papa out. Thank you.